Reverends, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this evening's session of our Holy Week retreat brought to you by Covington College. I am Seminarian Howard Bethel from the Diocese of the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos Islands. It's indeed a joy and a privilege to share with you once again this evening. Earlier today, we heard from my fellow seminarians, Rondina Roll and Hakeem Ma, as they took us back in time and opened our hearts and minds to the Holy Scripture of Mark on the teaching in the temple and the condemnation of the scribes. So I urge you to commit in joining us during our daily sessions with an open mind and heart, allowing the Holy Spirit to direct your thoughts as you absorb the word of God as presented to you. We will now have our introit hymn, hymn 347, The Church of God, The Kingdom Is. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that has passed. We thank you for every blessing seen and unseen. We thank you for the opportunity to read, learn, and inwardly digest your holy word. We ask that you continue to guide, our, to continue to be our guiding light through this holy week as we aim to grow closer to you, as we aim to renew our minds and refocus our hearts. Help us to open, be open to your word. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the word of God, written in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, beginning at verse one. As he came out of, the out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another, and all will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, 
when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pang. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if anyone knows me well, they know that I am not a big advocate of the good old days. And this is because for me, I admire growth and progress. However, there are times. There are times when I long for the days where we always left our doors unlocked, rather than locked, bolted, and secured with an alarm system. I long for the days when we could leave the house after breakfast, play all day with our friends, not return home until dinner time, and our parents never had to worry that we'd be abducted or any harm had come to us. Those days when school arguments were ended with double dares instead of physical violence, just as in, I intend to double dare you to meditate on the cross of Christ this evening. This was a sense of peace and security. The truth is, those were the days, the good old days. In our era, era, the true value and appreciation of this peace and security all came to the forefront during the many global, national, and personal crises we all encountered. We saw this during 9-11 when the towers fell and the Pentagon was attacked. The entire world felt threatened. We felt violated and exposed, and once again, the focus shifted this year to the war in Ukraine, as Russia seemingly invaded a country without warrant or right. Suddenly now, the threat of terrorism and war is everywhere. The aftermath of school shootings and other subsequent events in our communities has forced many of us to never feel truly safe, never walking alone, taking the necessary precautions to preserve ourselves. I say that to say this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we live in a broken and sin-filled world. As Christians, we are challenged to live as people of faith in such a world. But what does this look like? Today's gospel text gives us a glimpse of a life, of life in a broken world. As we look at this evening's reading from the gospel of Mark, we find that Jesus was going out of the temple. In chapter 12 of this same gospel, Jesus gave a lot of public teachings. Most of it was focused on the hypocrisy and emptiness of the religious leaders specifically. And there, for all of Judaism by extension, the religion had been ritual, become ritualistic and external, a system of good works motivated by corrupted hearts. It had no power to regenerate or transform hearts. At this point within the gospel narrative, some of the disciples are impressed with the new temple that Herod the Great started to build. It was larger than any previous temple and certainly one of the most impressive structures in Jerusalem. The temple was more than simply a beautiful building, though the temple was a sign of God's presence with Israel. The temple was Israel's connection point with God and also the symbol of their identity as God's people. What wonderful stones and buildings. The disciples were enthralled with the imposing splendor of this building and it was magnificent, magnificent. However, Jesus was not so enthralled. The temple could almost be considered a sign of the current state of Judaism. 
Outwardly, it was beautiful, spectacular. People who saw it would be struck by its grandeur and sheer size and its organized state. Yet inwardly, it had become a place of business. It had become a come like an institution. People used it for making money. Leaders who ran it cared more about dressing up in fancy clothes and wearing expensive designer wear than they did about the needy sinners Jesus ministered to. Instead of believing in the Messiah, they schemed and plotted to kill him, maligned his character, and questioned the legitimacy of his miracles, and, in ev and even those who stood as evidence of his miracles, such as Lazarus. This is what happens when we try to bridge our own way to God. When we try to understand God for the ways of God is beyond our understanding. We strive for doing good deeds, but end up falling sadly short because it ends, in the end, we have no real relationship with God. The question is, my brothers and, sis my brothers and sisters, are we like the money changers and the Pharisees? Are we like those who are concerned more about ourselves than others around us? Are we like those questioning the authenticity of the wonder working power of God? Would Jesus condemn us and our church and they, the way we function in life in the same way he did the temple? Would he condemn us like he did the religious leaders? Not one stone will be left upon another. Jesus tells them that the temple will be destroyed and a time will come when not one stone is set on another. Jesus' word could be compared to making the statement that the Parliament building or Cotterton College and the cathedral or some significant historical or religious structure will be destroyed. The world as the disciples knew it was going to come to an end. Just as we feared that our world would come to an end during Y2K. Like us, the disciples scrambled to figure out how to live in such uncertain and trying times. The disciples first asked Jesus to tell them the signs that would precede the end times. They believed that if they knew the future, they would be able to deal with it. The present might be uncertain, but if the future is assured, then we can live with that uncertainty. So many people seek to know the future even today. The disciples asked Jesus for the signs that this would be fulfilled. It seemed that their question, when all these things are going to be fulfilled, referred to Jesus' second coming, which would be the culmination of all these things. Jesus lists out many signs. While many of them were fulfilled at least partially in 70 AD, it is clear for us in verses 24 and 27 that the ultimate fulfillment would be Jesus' second coming. Because Jesus, is, because Jesus describes the first of these signs as the beginning of birth pangs. We can conclude that this period of turmoil in world history started all the way back in 70 AD and will merely increase until, until Jesus is coming. A woman might experience some birth pangs weeks before her baby is born. Sometimes they grow more serious and sometimes less, they lessen again. Finally, in the last day before the birth, they grow steadily more painful until the pain is almost impossible to bear. Then finally, the baby is born. That is very much what these signs are like. Basically, they last from the beginning of the church age until the end of it. Sometimes these signs are more evident and sometimes they are less evident. But in general, they would increase especially towards the end, right before Jesus is coming. Let's take a look at some of the signs. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. Ever since Jesus' ascension, this has been true. Many false prophets and Christ have come and made claims and tried to get a following. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, 
It is still happening today in cults and other organizations across the world. Wars and rumors of wars. These point to the instabilities of the world. The world is not going to be a paradise prior to Christ's return. Satan and sin still reigns. Unlike some people believe, the world is not going to keep getting better and better until Christ returns. Nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This has happened throughout the history of the world. In the 1900s, nationalism was in, was in a, few, a fever pitch. Wars occurred on a global scale never seen before. And even today, the risk of a nuclear war is just great. Earthquakes and famine. All the way back in Genesis, we see that God's curse because of sin includes separation from God, conflict with other people, and earth, and an earth that is cursed and will cause problems for people. These things again show instability and the need for divine intervention. No matter how smart people get, they have not learned, we have not learned how to control nature. We cannot control the hurricanes, the volcanoes, the tornadoes, no matter how advanced technology is. People have not figured out how to eliminate hunger. These signs show us that the pride of man, which has caused us to believe we can control anything without the assistance of God, is ill-placed. So what do we learn from this, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Firstly, you must see to it that no one misleads to you. We must be wary. The world is filled with false teachers seeking to lead people astray for their own benefits. Do not believe them. Do not fall victim. Do not be manipulated. Always look to the Bible and ask, what does the Bible say? Do not fall for smooth sounding speech which is contrary to the word of God. Secondly, these are merely the signs. Generally speaking, these things tell us that the world is unstable and Jesus will return. Generally speaking, these signs will increase prior to Jesus' return. Yet one specific war, earthquake, famine, hurricane, or volcano, or even 10 of them, do not necessarily mean that Jesus' return is going to happen within the same specific time frame. Remember that in 7080, many of these signs were happening, and yet we know that Jesus still hasn't returned almost 2,000 years later. And lastly, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I double dare you, I double dare you to be ready. I believe that this is the most important principle Jesus wants us to give from, get from this. His coming is imminent. It could be at any time. These signs are happening. Perhaps he gave these general and somewhat vague signs primarily so that we would always be reminded that he is coming back to set us all right. My brothers and sisters in Christ, are you ready? Will you be ready? At this time, I would like for you to take an opportunity for a moment to reflect. I would like for you to reflect upon the temple in your life. Reflect upon the signs of the time and what have you done to get ready. Have we all utilized the time of preparation and fasting to recenter our lives and focus our eyes on Jesus? Let us silently reflect.
let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us. And to all who you have made, we bless you for your creation preservation, and all the blessings of life, but of all, above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the, for the hope of glory. And we pray that you give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Thank you for joining us. And we ask that you please like and share this stream with your family and friends. Also, please be reminded to tune in tomorrow for our morning, midday, and evening sessions to be uplifted, enlightened, and inspired this holy week by the seminarians of Cogitin College. Have a blessed evening. We will now have our concluding hymn, Lord, Thy word abideth, page 397 of our CPW hymn.